Welcome to the Watchman Privacy Podcast. I'm Gabriel Custodiat, a privacy consultant and author of The Watchman Guide to Privacy, available on Amazon. I also offer a Bitcoin privacy course at bitcoinprivacycourse.com. Either of these supports the show and makes sure it keeps going. You can find links in the video description. In this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with former UFC fighter John Fitch. What's the occasion? Well, consider this. All of the privacy techniques we talk about in this show and in my book are designed to give you physical safety at the end of the day. That's what privacy is for. When your enemies know where you live, then they can swatch you, they can stalk you, they can steal from you, they can do what they want. Your enemy today might be some kid who dislikes you online and finds your home address on a people search website or through social media. Public figures know this all too well. As of the time of recording this episode, U.S. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene has been swatted apparently multiple times, which means that someone called in a hostage situation to her address and heavily armed SWAT teams showed up. People have been killed in the past from swattings. I also listened recently to the criminal who held up at gunpoint Kim Kardashian in Paris in 2016. He was reflecting on the crime and told a reporter, quote, Since she was throwing money away, I was there to collect it, and that was that. Guilty? No, I don't care. He continues to say celebs who flaunt their wealth online should, quote, be a little less showy towards people who can't afford it, end quote. It's amazing how twisted ethics have become, though perhaps not surprising coming from the basket case of France, where concepts of the right to property and freedom have dissipated since one of the greatest farces in modern history, the French Revolution. You couldn't pay me to live in France these days, especially with President Emmanuel Macron. The president in early 2022 refused to support a farmer who was arrested for defending his house from invaders. Macron said, I am opposed to self-defense. You can't make this stuff up. But returning to a different kind of criminal, today you have people monitoring Snapchat and TikTok and other social media for people who have any kind of wealth and using it to plan how, when, and where to rob them. You have Japanese stalkers who find actresses based on identifying reflections from a rain puddle in their photos. You have kids who are prepared to call in a swatting if you disrespect them while playing Call of Duty. You have people playing private investigator with widely available open source intelligence tools online that can easily lead them to where you live if you have not done things to hide that information. You have growing theft and disrespect for property. Recall the 2020 book I often mention, In Defense of Looting. Self-defense is crucial now and will be moving forward. That's one reason I wanted to talk to John Fitch. Fitch is an MMA fighter and a former decorated UFC competitor. He has in recent years become a commentator on cultural affairs. He has a YouTube channel that analyzes street fights, health, and the decline of masculinity, as well as things like media manipulation. John's advice in this episode is to avoid a fight if you can. This is important advice in a world where self-defense has legal ramifications. And here I'll say quickly, nothing in this episode is legal advice. I certainly encourage you to consider now how you will defend yourself, but just as important, what you will do afterward. It will likely involve already having a lawyer whom you have spoken to. It will likely involve you having already read and digested the book, You and the Police by the legend Boston Tea Party. And it will involve you having already made yourself aware of the self-defense laws where you live. John Fitch, welcome to the Watchman Privacy Podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing good, thanks for having me. So I was on uh, your podcast, which is called John Fitch, knows nothing. I'll have all these links in the description, of course, last year. And I was on there, I think, because you're obviously interested in things like big tech and, and privacy. Freedom. I'm a big I'm a big freedom guy. You're a big freedom guy, for sure. Big freedom guy. Leave me alone. Stay out of my business. Exactly. And privacy is a is a huge part of that. I guess I wanted to talk about your your own privacy journey to the extent that, that you're, you're on a privacy journey. Based on some of the stuff maybe we talked about last year or, or some of your own interests in the topic, uh, have you taken any action for your own privacy uh, in in recent months or, or recent years? Uh, I I I have not because I'm 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 a public figure and um, everything is kind of out there. I I I don't answer my phone. <laughs> That's one thing. Um, it's it's hard to get to me to contact me. Sometimes um, I try to put barriers up that way, but mostly I just don't I don't. I don't put anything that could be vulnerable really online much, but I mean, you're kind of forced to with banking and everything nowadays. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of overwhelming. It feels like the, the ocean kind of overtook you. 
and you're just knee deep in in uh in water and you got to figure out how to how to uh get all the water out of your house now i i totally agree with you i'm I'm sure people listening might also be on board which is why i suggest go go check out my book watchman guide to privacy we kind of walk you step by step you know it's it's never too late to to make yourself out of what you've been made into Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it, like every time you <clears throat> you buy something at the store and they want you to join a rewards program and they get your ad- email address and how many years you've been doing that type of stuff. <laughs> like somewhere there's a big file on you and they, they have a, a, a loose understanding of where you've been for most of your life. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and all this stuff is being collected by people search databases, which is something I've been working on recently. And so I, I guess that's why we're going to talk about self-defense today. <laughs> mm-hmm. So let's talk about self-defense. So uh, on this channel, we talk about how privacy is one's best protection, right? When you when you hide your, your IP address, which is which reveals your real life location, when you make sure not to give out your home address. And, you know, f- for me, right, I, I take the extreme route. The place that I go to bed in at any given night, I've never given that out. Nobody knows that. Uh, my phone has no GPS location data anywhere in the vicinity. So I'm kind of iron tight. I realize that's difficult for, for a lot of people. You have to you have to go to some extent to do that. But you do other things like you don't upload uh, your photos that you've taken near your house because that has geolocation data attached to it. When you do kinds of things like this, you might not have to get into a situation where you're swatted or where somebody's coming after you. Um, hopefully you won't be in a self-defense situation, but still this kind of stuff it happens, it's best to be prepared. And I thought, what better person to help us think about self-defense than than John Fitch? And so I guess I wanted to first ask you, Fitch, you obviously say, and let's, let's say it's not just a matter of defending yourself at home, but you're out in public where somebody's kind of approaching you, they're drunk, whatever the situation is. You always say that the best self-defense technique is to avoid conflict as yep. as much as you can to begin with. So do you have any thoughts, initial thoughts on just avoiding conflict generally? Avoiding, yeah, avoidance is number one policy. If you if you know there's a bar where people get in fights all the time, like don't go to the bar. <laughs> it's really, it's really simple. Uh, if you know there's you know a rough a rough area of town, it's better to stay away from it. Sometimes you're forced into situations, but generally speaking, you can you can avoid things just by staying out of the, the places where those things happen. Having good situational awareness is a major part of this. Uh, if you're head down, bar- eyes buried in your phone or in a book or or anything else, your your Apple Watch or whatever, you're not you're not in the moment. You're not paying attention to things going on around you, and that's a huge risk because you could easily see trouble coming if you were if you were up and head was looking around and you're watching people and their body language because people are very telling they're very deliberate with how they move body language is is huge like it's hard to fake a lot of things and when somebody's up to something you know the way they move their eyes the way they they uh uh, look around with their head uh their fincher their other fist you know clenched there's a lot of tells they can let you know that there's tension or something wrong with the situation so keeping your head on a swivel, like being in the moment, paying attention to what's going on around you will allow you to see things coming and, and allow you to to not have to deal with it. You know, if you're walking down the street and you see at the at the corner there's some there's some shady, homeless looking people and you'd rather not engage, go go to uh cross the street. Just cross the street, go to the other side, stay away from it. You don't have to feel bad about it. You're just taking a precaution. Yeah, that, that's good advice. I was I was walking around my neighborhood late last night, and uh, I thought I was being aware, but suddenly, maybe about five meters away, there was I noticed a lady was kind of walking, and if you know five meters away, she could she could have run and you know attacked me if it was somebody. And I realized, wow, I'm yeah. I'm not as aware as I I thought I would be. Um, mm-hmm. And any any advice for kind of practicing this sort of thing so that these things don't happen? Yeah, it's it's mental it's mental training. Like you have to wake yourself up and be like, okay, I'm, I'm going to be in this moment and I'm going to uh, be paying attention around me. It, it can be hard though, because your mind wants to wander. I know this, I know the feeling like I kind of got taken by surprise the other day walking my dog, you know, somebody popped up on the other side of the street. I was kind of too close. I, I thought there was nobody around me. 
it happens, but you want to be as diligent as you can. You know, at least you saw that person before they were right on top of you. You weren't, uh, your head down in the phone, your head down in the phone. You might not even have known there was a person there at all. They might've passed by you and you wouldn't even have known it. Yeah, that's a good point. Let's, I'm kind of moving up the the stage here to the point of self-defense, obviously to avoid it is, is key. Let's say that, let's say that somebody's upset, they're getting emotional, they're drunk, whatever the case may be. Any advice for de-escalating a encounter that you haven't been able to avoid, but maybe you can still de-escalate it? Yeah. A lot of times a good uh, de-escalation measure is to agree with the person and kind of amplify what they're saying. Because when it comes to a fight, the people want want you to match their energy and they kind of feeds off each other and the fight breaks out. So if you kind of kind of go with their energy or, or, and without pushing back and take it a step further, you know, they're like, you know, what's your problem? Are you retired? And you're like, yes, you're right. I'm, I'm mentally handicapped instead of like, oh, I'm not retarded. You're retarded. Like that escalates. So you deescalate by agreeing with them. And most people, they don't really know how to handle that because when you're getting into a fight, you want you want the back and forth. You want the satisfaction, that feeling of, I'm um, arguing with somebody. It's like two dogs barking at each other. You see uh, a video of like two dogs barking at each other through a fence. And then the, the owner opens the gate and they stop barking. You know, people want that energy, that feedback. So if you don't give them that, if you just be like, yes, you're right. I am dumb. They'll, they'll, they'll kind of run out of energy. Yeah. That, that takes some effort. I think, especially for a lot of guys, the testosterone is flowing they're, you know, they're, they're thinking they're not going to be the one to back down. It takes a little bit of humility, but you know, you, you don't want to get injured. Like nobody, nobody wins when, when there's a fight. So it's probably best to s- just suck it up. Now, what about being, you, you talk a lot about body language. You talk about the fact, of course, that bigger guys are, are not going to have people approach them more often just because they look more intimidating. What are some, maybe some, some body language that could itself be a deterrent? Let's say you're on a, you're on the New York subway and there's a, there's a crazy person. What, what mm-hmm. are some ways for you not to be the one to attract their attention? Well, the way you carry yourself, just the way you stand, you know, head up, eyes up, uh, shoulders back. Don't be, don't be hunched and, and, and shying away. Don't turn your back, you know, look confident. Basically people don't generally want to mess with confident, strong people. Not, not saying that the crazy person won't do that, but you know, you want to be in a competent, strong, confident stance, you know, how you stand being aware, like don't pretend that they're not there. They're just going to get more crazy. There was a study done, I think in the eighties where, uh, they asked a bunch of violent criminals to watch a video of people walking across like a mall and they had the criminals pick which people they would have attacked. And then uh, they came to the conclusion that it was it was a seven second average. It took those guys to pick who they would prey on, and when they asked, you know, they asked them the reasons. Like it was all because they they look like easy targets, and the number one things that they didn't want to happen, they didn't want to get caught. One and two, they didn't want to get injured. They picked the targets that most looked like they would not get caught messing with them and there was no way they would get injured with them. So the small, the weak, the timid, the people not paying attention, a person who's moving too quickly is somebody who's in a hurry and their head's probably not paying attention to what's going on. So that were a target. A person who's moving too slowly probably is weak or injured or something wrong with them. So they could be an easy target. It's kind of like National Geographic, right? You're like, you're, you're with a bunch of zebras walking. And if you stand out for any, for any reason other than being confident that you become a target. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought up that, that study. That's, that's certainly good advice. And it's what we talk about in terms of privacy, securing your house. You want to be the person who has the, the spotlight. You want to be the person who has the beware of dog sign. Because if the thief is coming to your house, they're they're not going to want to bother with that. They don't know if it's real. They don't know if you actually have a dog. They don't know if the the chew toy on. They're not going to ask if the chew toy in front of your house is is from a real dog or not. And I suggest people maybe consider a fake one. They're just going to go to the next house because that's the easier target. So you you put up uh, 
no trespassing signs will shoot on site. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's strong supporters of the second amendment, <laughs> you know, wh whatever funny sign you want to put up, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to arrest that in, in many cases. And so let's say John, that none of this stuff has worked. There's still going to be a conflict. And let's say that we were cognizant enough to be prepared for self-defense in order to bring some, let's say, non-lethal tools to to carry with us. Now, of course, we're we're not giving legal advice. You know, check your area. What's what's legal and what's not. Pepper spray, etc. We're not giving that kind of advice. Just speaking generally, what are some non-lethal tools that you think are people should consider carrying? Well, I mean, this thing. Uh, I'm I'm all for carrying some type of weapon, but not before you've had training. If you don't know how to grapple, if you don't know how to hand fight, if you don't know how to create space and maintain space, you carrying a weapon is just giving an attacker a weapon, okay? Weapons aren't magic. Guns aren't magic. Knives aren't magic. Just because you have one does not mean you know how to use it or you've trained to use it or you know how to use it under pressure. That's one of the biggest things. I have a client who's telling me a story about taking one of his friends uh, hog hunting. And the guy was one of the best shots, sitting on the stool, had the nicest gun, nicest setup, you know, nicest scope, best of everything. Takes him out on the field. He's got a nice, nice big pig to shoot, but fumbles, can't get the shot off, misses, the pig gets away. If you're not practicing under pressure, you're not going to be able to do it when it really happens. So if you're not actively training in something, like just because you have you have a weapon does not mean you're going to be able to get to it to access it or they're not going to take it away from you if you do get to it. Right. So so let's let's talk about let's talk about this stuff then. You're you're a big proponent of learning the fight. What I guess what kind of for somebody who's the total novice, let's say, what would you recommend them to get into and then how should they approach it? So one of the things everybody recommends the most is uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, PJJ. And it is great. I recommend it to a lot of people. And the, and the reason is because it's very low risk of injury. There's a lot of different levels of people for you to, for you to train with. There's a lot of opportunities for you to train. Uh, it allows for live, live sparring. So you're, you're going 100% trying to like submit or take the person down or, or do whatever right? You're, you're going full blast. So that's, that's using your tools under pressure. Like somebody's trying to choke you and you have to like fend them off. Then in, in real life, they're, they're actually trying to choke you. Okay. It's not like a, just a drill. So like, that's the type of pressure you'll get to feel. And it's pretty safe environment because you can tap whenever you want to. People are very nice and very kind in the, in that realm. So you can be trusted to do that. And it gets you a lot of great experience and it gets you on the mats and uh, moving around. And I, I highly recommend it. Although it is very sport based, you know, your objective in jujitsu is to submit the person you're with. I feel like some of a lot of the jujitsu has gotten away from the straight uh, Gracie self-defense jujitsu. And I think there are some combative courses and some people who have specific things that are designed for self-defense. My suggestion to people is um, do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and when you can, try to go to workshops that focus on specific uh, self-defense styles. Until I get, until I get uh, my programs available <laughs> for purchase online, then you can do the programs or you can have me out for uh, seminars. I can, I can teach you too. I can teach you a uh, condensed version of you know, the things you need to know the most to keep yourself safe. That's what I'm doing with my, my clients now. Right. And, and we should say that if you, if you're interested in learning this, you have some money and you want to get John privately, just check out his website. He, he does consulting, he does all kinds of things. And he even has, um, various courses, books, et cetera, talking about self-defense. So we'll, we'll definitely link to all of that. Now, uh, John, one of the things that people say when it comes to what, what's the best martial arts to learn for self-defense um, you, you, I think you've acknowledged this, that your selection of a, a grappling art like jujitsu is maybe a little bit unusual. A lot of people 
tend to favor the the striking disciplines. When you're in a self-defense situation, they don't want to have the risk of getting taken to the ground. They want to be able to flee. Maybe maybe explain why you favor the the grappling as opposed to the the striking disciplines. Well, for one, if you are um, at striking range, if you're far enough away to throw punches and kicks at somebody, you're far enough away to get further away. So it's not a boxing match. It's not Muay Thai. It's not MMA. It's self-defense. So avoidance is the best policy, right? If you are far enough away from that guy that you can throw a punch and hit him or he can throw a punch and hit you, you're far enough away to circle away and leave or circle away and put something in between you to create a barrier. Maybe there's a maybe there's a, a garbage can that's, you know, fixed to the ground. We're in the park or something. I can I can circle around a light post. Uh, why am I fighting this person? Am I getting paid? Is there is there a belt on the line? <laughs> Right? Like, why do, why do I need to throw hands with this guy? I'm trying to go for a walk. <laughs> right? So if you're far enough away to, to throw punches, then you you move away. Keep moving away. And, and, yeah. And so the grappling is, if things get to the point where you're grappling and an actual fight is like, there's, there's no way of avoiding it. You want to have those skills. If you're, if you're far enough away to kick somebody or punch them, you may as well just get further away and, and run away. Leave. Yep. You might as well just move and get out and find a door. Um, if And if you're in a situation, this is something I'm working on with one of my, my students. Uh, if you're in a situation where you can't retreat, uh, because he goes to a lot of sport sporting events, and that's one of the things he's worried about is some drunk guy getting in his face. And at those sporting events, like you're stuck in your row. There's no lateral movement there, right? So... Uh, we were working on that type of thing. You might not, and somebody's sitting down. You you can't move backwards. You, there's nowhere to go. You can't circle out. You can't move away. You got to sit in that pocket. And if that guy presses you, now you're going to be in a fight. So we work on something called uh, forcing the clinch. Okay, uh, we'll use a like a full shell type position with our hands, uh, palms on forehead, so that if they do throw a punch, we will you know, do our best block it with the forearms and we move into a clinch position that we can dominate. That way, once we're there, we're in control. We're too close for them to, to punch effectively and we can fight for hand and wrist control and things to make sure that, you know, they can't access weapons. We can stop the fight. Most people are in horrible shape and have zero cardio. So if you hand fight and grapple with somebody for 10, 20 seconds, they're exhausted. So by focusing on closing the distance and forcing the clinch, you can prevent any real injury to anybody. Because that's another thing you have to take into consideration. If, if a drunk guy gets in your face at a basketball game and you punch him and he falls and hits his head and dies, you're still going to jail. And drunk, drunk people are really easy to knock out <laughs> and they fall hard. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's talk about this. So let's say the fight happens, you subdue your assailant. What's typically the best thing to do now? You keep talking to them, you know, de-escalation. Honestly, people don't really want to fight. People, it's emotional outbursts. They, they want to be heard. You know, they're upset. They want to be heard. You can agree and amplify. You can coax them, talk them down. Hey, man, I don't want to fight. Once people start getting tired, once that adrenaline dumps and they realize, oh, shit, this guy... This guy could probably hurt me if he wanted to. They kind of relax. I think that's the approach. You subdue them. And and if you're in those situations, like at a ball game, like there's usually security. There's people around. Everybody's popping their camera out. You you punch somebody in the face and knocking them out looks a lot worse than you, you know, chicken winging a guy <laughs> and, and having him control until security comes and takes him away. That makes sense. Uh, similar question then, and again, we're not we're not giving legal advice, but I know that you talk about how anti self defense, especially Western culture, has become that if you defend yourself in any way, you could still go to jail. You're, you're still going to get in trouble. But even w within those confines, maybe and any thoughts for people to to grapple with the uh, the legality of self defense? Like how how should people think about that? Uh, so, uh, man, the uh, 
the old saying, you know, it's better to be tried by 12 than carried by six. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a good, you know, metric, but you got to make sure, like, if you're in that situation where you really think you're going to die, then you got to, you got to, you got to do whatever you have to do and just see how it plays out. It's just the way it is. But you really do have to take into account where you are, you know, what the laws are, who the DAs are, if you're going to get into a fight like you have to know like i don't like i'm going to run away from any fight that possibly pops up if i'm in san francisco i don't i don't care what the situation is i gotta grab my people and run away because unless i'm being it's like unless somebody's in the act of stabbing me in the back as i run away like i don't think they would justify me doing anything to defend myself and this is a professional fighter who's saying this. Um, I, I remember there was a there was a guy who was telling me he was part of the he was part of a SWAT team, and they they were they were one of the best in in I guess the U.S. and in these uh, kind of training things that they would go around and do these competitions. And he said, and they would obviously always go around armed. Uh, and they went to this shady neighborhood one time, and they they all just decided, look, no, we're not even going to risk it. We're going to get out of here. So I mean, if, if something goes down, nobody's going to win. Uh, whether that's legally or physically or or otherwise, not like it's, it, the engagement's not really worth it. Um, you know, if it was a different age, if it was a different time, different age, and you could defend yourself, you know, somebody wronged you, it's a different thing. It's a different story. I feel, I feel like there was a time in history where if we were walking down the street and I'm walking with my girl and like a, a crazy homeless person runs up and gets in her face, like I would be well within my uh, allowed limits to knock that person out. And it would be a more civil society. I, I agree. I think it would be a better place. But no, I would be a monster. I would go to jail. They would probably get canceled. Yeah. Yeah. What? what did you, <laughs> did just... you remember, um, what's his name, uh, Macron in France? There was an instance where a, a farmer uh, shot and defended his, his house from, from two assailants. And the guy went to jail. Yeah. And Macron said that yeah. we do not... I do not believe in self-defense. That should be handled by the state. I remember that. That yeah. makes my blood boil, that kind of stuff. It's crazy, crazy world. Uh, let's let's just talk a little bit more broadly about health, John, because you said most people don't have stamina whatsoever. A lot of people are, are just in terrible shape. And that's a, that's a big problem too. So just like the whole, oh, I'm going to use, a, I'm going to get a weapon and carry a weapon around, but you don't train and you don't know how to use it. Well, you're not in shape either. <laughs> and, you know, you're not in shape. You don't train. You have no strength or physicality about you at all. And you're going to carry a weapon. And that somehow is going to equalize. I mean, guns do equalize things, but only if you have it out and are ready to use it. If you have, you're just going to walk around with a gun in your hand all the time. <laughs> like, to, you're holding it to your chest like an operator. Like, you're just walking everywhere. You order your coffee. <laughs> just in case. And even then it's, something could pop up and you might not be fast enough to get your rounds off. <laughs> it, it helps. Weapons help. They definitely help. Guns are awesome. If you know how to use it, you know how to train, you know how to take it out. But if you're not in shape, you're going to have problems. And I don't, you don't have to be, um, man, you don't have to be a professional fighter at all. You don't have to, but you, you need to be able to if you could hand fight and grapple light for, for five minutes, that's pretty good for like self-defense and stuff, you know, because most people are tapped out before 30 seconds. So if you can, you can have somebody pulling on your head and your neck and pushing you around and grabbing your wrist for five minutes, that would be, that'd be pretty decent. So let's, let's not talk about basic techniques for, for getting healthy. I think people, if people think about it, it's pretty obvious. Don't eat the crap exercise with some consistency it, you, you don't need some fancy diet you know just mm -hmm. have some discipline I, I think i think uh i really i really think meal planning and meal prepping are whatever kind of scheduling for eating whatever you want to do some people eat once a day some people i eat six times i have six meals i eat a day so however you want to do that but i think scheduling works really well because it keeps you from snacking Let's say that somebody's listening, they have all the basics sorted out and they want to just be a little bit better should it come to grappling, striking, whatever the case may be, a little bit better at defending themselves. And they're going to the gym, they're doing bench press, they're doing um, deadlifts, some of the some of the stuff that's not, let's say, very 
athletic, very um, explosive. Any any thoughts? I mean, you're you're a fighter. For people who want to to be better at like real real life scenarios, what kind of exercises should they consider gravitating towards? Well, o- overall strength training, resistance training, any time any type you're doing is is going to be good. It's going to be helpful because resistance training leads to denser bones, stronger joints, stronger muscles, um, higher metabolic rate. It's just it's just better. You're just better off no matter what you're doing in life. If you're a little bit stronger, you're probably going to be better. Not probably. You are going to be better. <laughs> okay. Uh, so resistance training is one of the best things. And then mix that in with some high intensity interval training, some sprint workouts. Uh, and those can range from all, all sorts of different things. Anything where you're given full effort for a short period of time and then you get a short break and then you're back on the, the hard effort again, that's, that's where real fight cardio and fat burning really come from. Like the long, long form cardio, it does burn calories. Um, if you have fun doing it and, and it's like one of your ways of meditating, that's great. Like you keep doing it, but the best, in my opinion, for burning fat and, and being in fight shape are, is, is, is hit cardio interval training. You got to do the intervals, got to do sprints, fights or sprints. Yeah. There, there are very few scenarios where you're jogging for 10 or 20 miles. It actually has a real, real world application. As you said, a lot of conflict that happens, it's 10 seconds long. It's five seconds. It's 20 seconds. Even professional fights are only 15 to 25 minutes. So if you're doing an hour of cardio, that seems a little overboard. Uh, and also, like from an aesthetic perspective, look at marathoners' bodies compared to sprinters' bodies. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to have a marathoner body. Right, those you can still have kind of a little pooch belly <laughs> and some arm flab when you're a, a long distance runner. Yeah. I think a lot of people don't realize that the like the guy who ran the first marathon, he died. Right? Like it, the the human body was not is not necessarily supposed to have been doing that kind of thing. <laughs> but uh, so let's let's move on to as, as we kind of finish up here, John. Let's let's move on to some philosophical questions. So you you would say, and we we throw this term around a lot that you're red pilled. I, I know that's a little bit subjective, but basically how I interpret that, and I have a section in my in my book called uh, kind of a red pill reading list. We're talking about people being aware of the control mechanisms around us, whether that is uh, mm-hmm. right, the the problems with government and centralization. And we can read, you know, Murray Rothbard, listen to Peter Schiff, th- these kind of figures to uh, be aware of what central banking is, Federal Reserve. We could talk about Rolo Tomasi and, and things like the rational male red pill, where we talk about the decline of masculinity mm-hmm. um, as, a, as a serious social problem. Yep. We could talk about exposing big tech uh, there, there's various elements to this. I'm curious, though, what, what was your first, let's say, red pill moment? What what got you into this kind of skeptical thinking? Oh, man. There's kind of, the thing is, there's kind of like red pills for all types of things, right? Because there's like red pill for MMA. There's red pill for intersexual dynamics. There's red pill for government. There's, you know, you know what I'm saying? There, there's like the outward projected image and what you're told it is, and then the underbelly of what actually is going on. Right. Exposing the the mainstream view, which has we're, we're starting to realize is just wrong in many cases. Yes. So, I mean, I, I had touches of it, like when, like with relationship stuff, I had touches of it uh, and saw parts of it when I had a roommate in uh, college who was a player and watching him operate was a real kind of red pilling moment. I got pulled back into the the matrix though, because it wasn't, I, I wrote it off as just a, oh, that just, you know, was worked for him or whatever type of thing. You know, even though I, I copied his tactics and it worked for me too, I just took it off as, oh, that just worked for him and I was lucky. I didn't, I didn't really understand quite yet. Um, and I got, I got pulled back into the matrix <laughs> with that stuff. Uh, but, you know, uh, with 9-11 and Iraq war and the uh, whatever, the anthrax powder and all the nonsense that happened around that and everybody beating the, the war drums uh, from both sides. Like there wasn't anybody saying no. I was like, that was a red pill moment politically for me. But for me, I was like, okay, this is a scam. And I 
didn't pay attention to politics until Obama in the uh, like 2008, like financial stuff. Cause I got stuck with a, I got stuck with a house. So I started paying attention to politics again then. But then my other big red pill, my permanent red pill type thing happened with uh, my divorce really kind of wake me up to a lot of that, you know, the issues with MMA and uh, the structure there. Like I'm the guy who's been out trying to, I'm the Morpheus. I'm out trying, I've been out trying to red pill everybody about what's going on since I started with those guys, you know? So there's a lot of, there's been a lot of moments where I've kind of realized things weren't as they seemed. And I, I tried to push back. It, it's not just UFC. It's the uh, entire MMA industry is built on a, a corrupt and illegal model where someone would eventually monopolize the whole market and that that's what has happened. So anybody who wants to read up on, on the, the class action lawsuit we have going on, you can go to UFC uh, class action dot dot com. Um, what happened with the UFC is they control the UFC title, um, which has become the number one best title because they purchased all the competitors. In purchasing their competitors, they they acquired their competitors' belts, and they uh, acquired the top fighters from all those those uh, promotions. <laughs> so now you had one promoter with the top belt and all the top contracts. Um, the problem is that is a built-in monopoly because now no other promoter can compete because they can't fight for the UFC title. This, this is a problem that was in the late 1800s with, with, with prize fighting back then. The promoter controlling the title and the exclusive contracts led to monopolization every time. So you would have one promoter who had all the money, all the fighters coming to him, no other promotions could compete. If, if that promoter didn't like you as a fighter, you were screwed. You're never going to get a, a, a shot at that title. In all sports, there is always some type of organization that controls the title away from the event uh, providers or the promoters. And what is, what's stopping somebody from coming up with a competitor to, to UFC? They, it, let's say they, they wouldn't have the UFC title. Couldn't they have their own rankings and rewards and such? Who would fight for it? Why would anybody care? All the best fighters are in the UFC. And if you want to be a fighter and you want to be taken legitimately, you have to fight for them. Because there are, there are other places out there. There are other promotions out there with titles and people are saying they're making money. They're not making – UFC is making 90% of all the money in MMA. Um, uh, the UFC um, has the number one title. So every champion from every other organization would gladly jump ship and fight for the UFC. But there's not a single UFC champion that would jump shit and want to fight for someone right. else. Maybe you need that Saudi Arabia money, <laughs> new, new league. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the 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 money gets soaked up by UFC. They they keep they keep eighty percent of the the gross proceeds instead of fifty percent, like every in every other sport. But that that's the underlying uh, problem is. Uh, and it's and it's supposed to be illegal in the U.S. to control uh, exclusive contracts and control a title. You're not supposed to do it. They they took the titles away from promoters uh, in the late 1800s in boxing, or not just boxing, it was prize fighting. And then they gave it to the state, the state athletic commissions. And they ran, the state athletic commissions ran things for a while, but there became a monopoly in the state with the state athletic commissions because uh, New York was the biggest state and had the most money. So of course their title became the most sought after because the fighters would make more money. There was more viewership. Uh, there was more attendance at the fights because there's more people there. But that meant that any promoter in any other state was unable to compete in boxing promotion because none of their fighters, nobody wanted to fight for them because their belts didn't bring in the eyeballs or the money that the New York title did. So all the fighters then also had to move to New York to fight if they wanted to be taken seriously. So then they started the independent titles uh, and they created a, a sanctioning body license, something like 1926, 1925, 1926. So then they started creating an independent 
companies, uh, sanctioning bodies to control the titles and control the rankings. So then at that time, then any promoter could start a promotion at any time, right? Like you could start one tomorrow and then you, like in boxing today, if you won, you had billions of dollars, you're like, you know what? I want to, I want to promote. I want Canelo. <laughs> you call up Canelo like, hey, I want to double whatever so many whoever's paying you whatever. Like now he's your champ. And when you put on shows, like you can use him to fight for belts. You can use him to fight for the top belts. That that can't happen in MMA. Kind of connected to all this stuff, we get to the topic of cancel culture. There are a lot of people saying the wrong things and they're getting kicked off various platforms. Most recently, most prominently, Andrew Tate, another guy in this uh, rational male. And, and Andrew Tate, he was on Tucker Carlson and he, he had a good line. He always has these good lines. He says that they took out, first they, they took out my, Facebook account and then Instagram. And before I knew it, my payment processor and my bank accounts, and it just goes down the list. I mean, we were, we were a lie on all these third parties. It, it, it's crazy. Somebody can really, really take you out. Now, I'm just curious if you, yeah. have you encountered any cancel culture in, in your own stuff so far? My, uh, Insta my Instagram is on restricted mode. So people can't share my account. People can't tag me in things. Uh, when people try to follow me, it'll give a warning. <laughs> Are you sure you want to follow this person? He, he posts, he often posts, uh, makes posts that are whatever factually incorrect right. or some shit. So like I'm in, I'm in timeout from that. Uh, I, yeah, my follower count has been frozen for months. <laughs> um, my, my Twitter feed, I, I get, I think I'm shadow banned on there. I think I have been for a while. Like people don't see a lot of my stuff. So I guess my question, John, is why don't you just believe what CNN has to say, sponsored by Pfizer? <laughs> I just don't understand how these people, they're just too busy with their own, with their own what? I don't even know what they're, what are they doing that they're not understanding that these people are just lying out of their ass to them? Are they really so in, involved, enveloped in their own, their own lives, like picking up, going to, going to get brunch and <laughs> their happy hours that they're not? They're not paying attention at all. They're just, they just, I don't know, man. People just take it and uh, take whatever's on the news and believe it. Yeah, I, I've, I fortunately not encountered a lot of this so far, mostly because I have a smaller audience at this point. I did notice that my climate change surveillance video still has a poultry amount of views and it's not really going anywhere. So maybe that's, maybe that's one example. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot more to come because I don't, I don't silence myself. I do a show with uh, Jason Burmis and regular comments about how throttled he is on YouTube. Can't, can't get any growth. They demonetize his videos all the time. He, uh, I can't remember what his girlfriend writes for some, some, uh, platform and she gets a lot of views and he'll embed his videos. She'll embed his videos sometimes in her stories and, uh, he's on another platform called Rockfin. It's a, a platform I'm on too. Rockfin, Rock, Rockfin R O K F I N dot com. Check it out. It's really cool. It pays in crypto to creators. But um, on, when he posts, when when she tags the uh, Rockfin video, which is the same video, it does you know crazy views. But when she when she uses the YouTube post of the same uh, video, like hardly any views. So YouTube is definitely throttling the numbers even if because like the people why would the people read watch the video in one article and then in the next article they don't they don't watch the video so if they're watching the video but youtube's not counting the ticks and i'm and i'm pretty sure uh most of social media is fake like the people the influencers who have the most followings and the most influence and the most people commenting i think a lot of it is 100 percent fake it's corporations and just pumping this stuff out. They have hundreds of thousands of their own bots and they're the ones interacting. And I think they push a lot of nonsense uh, to make it seem like it's more popular. Yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to write a good book or do a great investigation of just how much these bots influence our lives. I'm reading a book right now that might uh, touch on a little bit. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, Shadow Men. And it's, it's basically talks about how, I mean, I'm only like two pages into it, but it talks, it talks about how people have been pulling the strings to control humans for a while. Anthony Napoleon. 
So yeah, John, we'll we'll, we'll get to your uh, we'll we'll plug your stuff in a second here. A- any final thoughts though? I know our conversation has covered a few things: self defense, uh, cancel culture, masculinity. Any kind of final thoughts for the listener? Uh, uh, no, um, you know you've got to really you've got to be a jack of all trades. I'm sorry to say it. You got to you got to have some knowledge uh, in how to defend yourself. You need to have some knowledge in uh, health. You know, your health nutrition has to be at a certain level. Like it wouldn't be it wouldn't be okay for for you to not know how to read. It, it's not it's not healthy. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't be like, Oh, it's okay. Not everybody needs to know how to read. You know, we really need to take your, your personal health and personal safety and self-defense seriously. You know, uh, I think it, I think it's as bad as being illiterate. You don't have to be a world champion, but you should be able to make the fight harder, make weak people not want to mess with you. So train, (laughs) take it seriously doesn't have to engulf your entire life. You don't have to spend hours and hours a day, but you need to do something. I've got, I've got, uh, if they go to my website, johnfish.net, I got links to my Gumroad. I have Gumroad courses. So I have, I have things available, fitness training, uh, that keep things simple because I don't like spending a lot of time doing nonsense. Um, so they can check those things out. I only spend about 35 minutes, 45 minutes doing my lift and then my cardio is, is usually under 20 minutes too. I only do that two to three times a week. And I'm, I'm in my forties and I still am looking pretty good, you know, keep it simple. Excellent. Good advice. We will have links to all of your stuff. And if you don't want to look at the description listeners, johnfitch.net, J O N F I T C H. And you can find his stuff from there. He does personal consulting. I'm sure just hit him up. If you, if you got some money and, and you, you want to get the, the premium services or he offers other stuff as well for the average person. Support him, please. And John Fitch, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thank you for having me.